Hi, everybody, and you're very welcome to this next episode of the series of Father Shane Sullivan. Just a quick reminder, during the course of this episode, at times Father Shane may refer to handouts or to questions that people are, being, are asking him. The reason he does this is that this these episodes were recorded primarily for a prayer group that Father Shane runs in the Archdiocese of the Tune, and he's been running this prayer group over Zoom. And because of that, members of the prayer group have been, they've been given a handout and they've also asked questions. So just in case you're wondering what he's referring to there, that, that's, that's essentially what it is. But don't worry, you're not missing out. You can still follow the whole episode and the whole series uh, clearly. You're not going to be lost. And look, I, I really, really hope you enjoy it. God bless. All right. So welcome everyone again to our fourth session on an introduction to prayer. So we'll begin just by asking the Holy Spirit to be with us and to guide us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill thy faithful, and kindle within us the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great. So today we come to the final stage of the spiritual life, which is called the unitive way. And uh, we begin by the kind of entry point into the unitive way that most people, if you have read maybe Lives of the Saints or whatever, uh, have heard of the entry way into the unit of way it's called the dark night of the soul cue the ominous music right because everyone's heard of the dark night of the soul and it might strike them as i don't know sort of uh like particularly scary and um so hopefully we'll be able to explain what some of that is and you'll be able to see the beauty behind it because truly it's uh of god's design right so if you've noticed there's a pattern in the spiritual life right the entry point into each of these three stages is marked by like a purification and a conversion. It's like the same thing, right? So as an example, when you go into the first stage of the spiritual life, the purgative way, there's a turning away from sin and a turning towards beginning to strive for virtue. Um, this is the entry point into the uh, purgative stage, right? And again, one of the favorite things of some of the saints is to liken it to the lives of the apostles. And that moment for them was when they dropped their nets and they began to follow Christ. Then you've got that move into the second stage, the illuminative way, right? Now, that, has, uh, that's, that takes place after you've made good progress in the first stage, the purgative way. So what happens is, you experience, we talked about it last week, you experience something of your own nothingness, your poverty, right, um, before God. And also you experience how self-oriented your love still is. For the apostles, this took place when they fled from Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, or in Peter's case, when he denied him. And then when the Lord, when Jesus looked at him, and kind of gazed on him and it like broke Peter's heart. This is called the dark night of the senses. Okay. So this is the move in from the purgative way to the illuminative way, dark night of the senses. And it's called that because God draws back from you. Now he doesn't draw back in grace, right? It's not as though God doesn't forgive you or God leaves you, but what he does is he withdraws some of the consolations that you'd experienced in the first stage of the spiritual life. The sensible constellations, that's why it's called the dark night of the senses. That's what St. John of the Cross calls it. So that, this is God's sort of the, the reason, the rationale, it's so that you come to love God for who he really is and not just for what he can give you. And this is now the entryway into the illuminative way, okay? So now the next conversion happens when you've made good progress in the illuminative way. You've grown in the love of God, 
right? And you've become more like him. That's the whole illuminative way thing. You've meditated on his attitudes and attributes, his priorities, the way that he is, and you have come to become, you've become more like him. You've grown in conformity to Jesus, it's called. Now, God withdraws again. Now, the way that God withdraws this time is he withdraws those things that the soul had enjoyed in the illuminative way. So things like his sensible presence or knowledge of him, uh, the desire for, for God's glory, the, the kind of the felt love of God, the zealous love of God, and the, the love of salvation of souls, right? So, um, the soul is left dry. It's left sometimes in bitterness and anguish. It is in total darkness. This is what St. John of the Cross calls the dark night of the soul. Sounds awful, doesn't it? Sounds very difficult. But God knows what he's at. God knows what he's at, right? This is another purification. What's purified in the dark night of the soul? Well, the most important virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and also humility. These are kind of purified. They're taken to the next level, basically, in this dark night of the soul. So first of all, humility, right? Humility is perfected so that the soul comes to know its own poverty like never before. Faith is purified. So you probably heard scripture, the definition that scripture gives to faith, which is assurance of things unseen, the assurance of things unseen. Well, now the soul is in darkness, right? It's in total darkness. So it strives to continue to believe, even without any of the lights, the helps that God had given it in previous stages. The soul learns to rise to the very heights of faith. Hope. Hope is also purified. The soul strives to hope even when the possibility of heaven seems difficult to even imagine. Mother Teresa talks about this, actually, um, in her kind of spiritual diaries, that heaven seemed unreal and unattainable at times. So the, the soul learns to have hope even when it's so difficult and last, love is purified. Faith, hope, and love, right? So the soul has to learn to love even when it feels utterly abandoned. Even when it feels unloved by God. The soul has to love, learns to love even then. Yet, God never truly leaves the soul. Now, you might ask yourself, what does any of this have to do with the unitive way? right? Or union with God. Well, remember this, Jesus is a true leader, right? So one of the things that a real leader, that marks a real leader is that a real leader never asks you to do something that he's not willing to do himself, right? So he endured all that darkness, the struggle to hope, the feeling of abandonment in his passion. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The soul now experiences what Christ did on the cross. And so follow me now, right? There is a greater unity between the person and God in that dark night of the soul than they have ever had before, than there's ever been before. Now, I know that sounds very scary, okay? But... Listen to this now. The unitive way is about the soul becoming united with God, obviously, right? Between, becoming united with Christ, yes, even in his passion and his death, like the dark night, but also in his resurrection, right? So even though there are still purifications in the spiritual life, or in the, in the unitive way, rather, so even though purifications continue to happen, even after the dark night of the soul, the soul learns actually to love them because 
it's moving closer towards its long desired goal of God himself. Garrigou Lagrange, who's this uh, famous theologian, and he's compiled a lot of this kind of spiritual wisdom of the saints. He says this, I'm going to quote from him, quote, those who follow the way of generosity, self-denial, and self-sacrifice, which the saints have taught, will come at length to know and taste the joys of God's complete dominion within us. In other words, they will come to experience a share in the risen life of Christ. Now, the saints love to describe what this risen life of Christ is like and what it's like for the soul to share in it. Um, but at the same time, the saints, even the greatest saints, seem to struggle. They like, it's almost as though words escape them. You know, they can't quite capture it, right? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three images that they use, right? Just to explain just the, the awe-inspiring beauty of what God does in the soul, all right? So the first image is this. It's called the divine awakening, the divine awakening. Now, I know that sounds like some new age mumbo jumbo, all right? But it isn't. It's St. John of the Cross. <laughs> so you know it's good, okay? Um, the divine awakening. What he describes is that St. John of the Cross describes that after the dark night of the soul, right? It is, the, it is as though God, he said, who dwells in the depths of your soul in grace, God dwells within your soul in, as, in grace, quote, gently and lovingly awakens like from sleep to take the place in your soul as Lord. God gently and lovingly awakens. And he actually uses the images of like breathing, you know, kind of if you're not, if your alarm clock wakes you up, <laughs> right. But if you're, if you're able to wake up naturally and you know, kind of like the, you wake up and you know, it's kind of an easy awakening, right? He gently and lovingly awakens in order to take the place in your soul as Lord. And then from there, God fills to overflowing with his goodness and glory, your soul. That's one image, okay? I'll give you another one. This is from St. Catherine of Siena, right? So she says that those who have gone through these purifications, you know, throughout the spiritual life, these conversions that we're talking about, and that dark night of the soul, those who've gone through all of that have, have had all of their self-serving desires burned away, as it were. And so the image that St. Catherine of Siena uses is of thirst, thirst. The soul now thirsts for the glory of God and the salvation of souls alone. And every other thirst is spent and dead. That's how she describes it. Every other thirst has been burned away. And now the soul thirsts only for God, right? Now, the soul finally comes to God in the unitive way. Comes to God himself, whom St. Catherine of Siena describes as the ocean of peace. So this terrible thirst, this desperate thirst, now only that will be satisfied by one thing, right? All these other thirsts have been sort of uh, burned away. Now, she says in the unitive way, the soul comes to the ocean of peace and the thirsty soul drinks freely, but without ever tiring of it. And then she adds that the soul plunges itself into this ocean, into God ever more deeply. And there finally finds peace. Isn't that a beautiful image? I'll give you one more. Now, Whatever all of those other images, and there's, there's plenty more where that came from as well. But of all of the beautiful images that the saints kind of reach for, right? The favorite by far seems to be marriage, marriage. So the soul, having cooperated with God's work, right? All throughout those different stages has been now sanctified and made ready like the bride from the book of Revelation. 
I'm not sure how many of you have read the book of Revelation. Most of the time people think of it as like ah, kind of a weird book and there's lots of different very figurative language that's used, etc. If you go to the end, the last two chapters, 21 and 22, you have this beautiful description of the city of Jerusalem as being, as having been made beautiful, and it describes in great detail the features of the city. God has made this city beautiful and now comes to her like a like a bride, and he like its groom, like her groom. So the soul, having gone all, through all these purifications, has now been made beautiful by God. The absolute heights of the spiritual life finds the soul ready to give herself to God incrementally. Just like a marriage. The saints recognize that there's a moment of betrothal. There's a spiritual betrothal that they describe in the spiritual life. Where the soul gives herself more, as it were, to God. God comes to be um, present in the soul and to, to be Lord of our souls, of our whole lives, more than he ever has before. He has more of a share, a part in our, in our life than ever before. That's a spiritual betrothal. And then finally, spiritual marriage, which is the absolute summit of the spiritual life, which isn't marked by fireworks. This is beautiful now. It's not marked by fireworks or sort of like, I don't know, real exciting kind of passions or whatever. No, like a human marriage, which is matured. It's marked by a blending of two lives with nothing that they don't share. It's marked by what the, the spiritual writers call serenity. In other words, peace and quiet rest with assurance of one another's love. Peace and quiet rest with one another, assured of the other's love. And then finally, with a great and abiding strength, this is a love that lasts. Think of the Blessed Virgin Mary if you want an image of this, right? The great example of the bride of God. Her life was so entwined with God's, so entwined with Christ that you couldn't separate them. They share everything. I read just as, you know, in these kind of like some of these spiritual writers, think of Mary's Magnificat, right? She speaks in scripture. She's kind of like melding together all of these scriptural traditions in the Magnificat, right? She speaks in scripture. His words, in other words, are her words. Again, if you go to that last two, those last two chapters of the book of Revelation, which I'd, I would recommend to you, the bride and the spirit say the same thing. They say to the one who's reading, come. In other words, it's like an invitation. Come. The bride and God speak the same words. That's true of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And that's what each soul God is leading each soul level of unity. And yet, as incredible as all of that is, as, as amazing, the saints are all unanimous. All of that pales in comparison to the union and glory that awaits in heaven. Heaven is something that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it so much as dawned on the mind of man what God has ready. Now, having scribed the unitive way and the beauty of where God is leading the soul, now I want to tell you about the prayer that's associated with this, this life, this, this way. Now, before I do that, I want to say this. You might be thinking to yourself, I'm nowhere near what you're describing. <laughs> so you might as well just not even talk to me about this type of prayer, right? Well, not so fast, okay? Because contemplative prayer is not exclusively and alone for people 
like St. Teresa of Villa or St. John of the Cross or St. Catherine of Siena or whomever. No, contemplative prayer seems to be something, even they themselves say, something that God helps those who are making progress in the spiritual life, who are growing in virtue, and who are moving away from sin, that God helps the soul to experience and to engage in this prayer, contemplative prayer that I'm about to describe to you. So it does have something to do with you, all right? Even if you feel like, oh gosh, that's those the heights that you're describing, the beauty, I'm just not there yet, you know? That's okay. This is still very relevant for all of us. Believe me, I'm in the same boat as you. Okay. So now we come to the type of prayer that's most typical of this unitive way, which is called contemplative prayer. So you might think, as you make progress in the spiritual life, you might think that prayer gets more and more complicated, complex, right? But in fact, the exact opposite is true. Prayer gets more and more simple the closer you get towards God as you kind of grow, as you mature. So you've got two types of contemplation. The first is called acquired contemplation, and the second is called infused contemplation. Uh, contemplation. Okay. So first of all, acquired contemplation. What's that? It is this nice little definition. The soul's simple and loving gaze on God and Jesus Christ or one of his mysteries or another truth. A simple and loving gaze of a soul upon God or Christ or a mystery or a, or a divine truth. Acquired contemplation is really like a simplified form of effective prayer. The thing that we were talking about last week, the thing that was particularly, I don't know, like found or, you know, again, particularly found, not exclusively, but particularly found in the illuminative way, right? Acquired contemplation is like a simplified form of that. Why is it simplified? Well, I, I should say, I, I kind of, I misspoke actually. It's like a simplified form of both discursive prayer, which is the, the thing that we talked about two weeks ago in the purgative way, and also effective prayer, which we talked about last week. Okay, so first of all, discursive prayer, right? In discursive prayer, it takes a long time to kind of think our way. We're using our minds an awful lot in discursive prayer. It takes us time to think our way to, towards the truths about God. Well, now in acquired contemplation, we behold God or Christ or those truths as at a glance. It happens much more quickly, much more simply. You don't have to put in the, it's not the effort required that discursive prayer involves. It's a simplified form also of of effective prayer, right? In effective prayer, you have many acts of the will, right? To love God, to ask his mercy, to make a petition, uh, to express sorrow, you know, these, all these different things, these acts of the will. Well, now in acquired contemplation, they, the soul is kind of absorbed in beholding God. And in that one act of the will, where there used to be like many, and you would use words to describe them, maybe not out loud, but you you would sort of be making acts of the will using words within your your mind and heart. Now, in acquired contemplation, those acts of the will, like loving God, lingers. It stays. You stay loving God for a number of minutes. Again, the, the spiritual writers say, maybe, maybe even as many as 10 minutes. You're just in a simple, um, a simple move, gazing upon God and loving him. And often words, there's very few words, if any at all. That's the difference between affective prayer and acquired contemplation. So there's not a method for this type of prayer because it's so simple. All it is, is to contemplate, to gaze upon God or Jesus 
or some truth even with love. That's most important. There's no method. It's just that to contemplate lovingly, to gaze upon God or, or Christ or some other truth lovingly. Still, some people find it, um, some practical tips helpful, right? To kind of um, get into this, right? So I'm just going to give you, I think there's three, okay? So first is some find it helpful to look at something visual still, right? So, um, you know, because what do you, do you just close your eyes? Some people do, you know, or, but sometimes people find it helpful to focus their actual physical eyes on something, right? On something visual. So you can make use of, for instance, the most blessed sacrament, adoration. So Jesus and the monstrance or the tabernacle to focus, fix your eyes on the tabernacle or a crucifix or some image, right? Some find it helpful to do that. Again, it's an interior thing of gazing upon God lovingly. That's what we're doing. But sometimes it's helpful for some people to still have the visual. Here's another, here's another tip, practical thing. Sometimes people find it helpful to use the imagination to contemplate. So to imagine Jesus in one of the many scenes from the gospel, for instance. Or to imagine yourself standing before Jesus silently. Again, it's more simple than maybe the methods and the sort of like the, the ways that we've uh, meditated before, right? But it's, uh, it's still sometimes helpful to use the imagination to place ourselves there in God's presence, to gaze on him lovingly. Okay, the third uh, practical thing is some find it helpful to slowly repeat a prayer like a like even like the Our Father or Hail Mary or some passage from Scripture, but you're not reading it. You're not like just kind of reading like you read normally, or you're saying like a vocal prayer. What you're doing is you're you're sort of uh, gazing upon the Father Himself or the truth of the Father or you know the Blessed Virgin Mary, and you're lovingly looking upon that with the eyes of your mind, so to speak, with your mind. With your soul, I think is a better way to describe that. Here's something to note. Distractions and dryness. Do you think they still happen in this stage? You better believe it. <laughs> of course they do, right? I'm afraid not. You're not getting away from the dryness and distractions, right? That we all experience in prayer. They happen here also. What do you do with these? You simply offer to the Lord those difficulties. And you know that even, remember that even if your imagination draws you away from God, right, that still your will is united with him. You can still love him even though your, your imagination is really playing puck, right? Offer to God that difficulty. Gently bring your attention back to God or to Christ or to whatever it is that you're focusing on. Okay. That's the first type of contemplation, acquired contemplation. Second type is infused contemplation. So this is a simple loving gaze on God or Jesus. But here's the difference, which is the result of God's action and where the soul is more passive. This is where God is more doing the moving than you are. The soul responds here. So it's not as though the soul is idle, the soul is doing nothing, no, no. But God is sort of capturing the attention of the soul and the soul is responding. This is, this type of contemplation is a pure gift from God. All of the saints say this, it's a pure gift from God which you can't reach by your own effort. God gives it. The best we can do, the most we can do is to prepare ourselves to receive that gift. Now, what does that mean to prepare yourself, right? 
Well, by preparing yourselves, the saints mean those, the process of detaching yourself from sin and self-love and growing in virtue and practicing mental prayer, effective prayer, what we were talking about in the uh, illuminative way, right? By doing those things, you're preparing your soul for this um, most simple, but yet highest form of contemplation. And it's the highest because it's God himself that's like doing work and we're responding to it. Here's how God acts in infused contemplation. God acts by fixing our attention on himself or some divine truth and by attracting the soul to him as the supreme good and drawing it like a magnet. You can imagine almost like a magnet. And here's really important. He draws it without doing damage to our free will. We always remain free and we respond freely to that, to God's drawing, to his attraction. Here's how the soul responds, right? So God does the moving. He fixes our attention. He attracts us like a magnet almost, right? By uh, showing himself to be the supreme good. Here's how we respond, the soul. The soul responds by beholding God or that truth and moving towards him in love with all its strength. With what you've got, now you're, you're responding to God's, um, to God's action lovingly. You're, you're giving it your, your all. So it isn't idle. You could say it's passive. It's the one that's being, that's receptive and responding, but it is very much still responding. So St. Teresa of Avila, she advises her sisters and her spiritual daughters to be this, totally generous with God and to serve him as best they can, but also to be humble and to let God invite them further and further on this path that we've been describing. You can desire it. You can want to go on and go further. That's a great thing. But try your way in. Generally, it takes, really, these, these furthest kind of stages, generally it takes years of committed discipleship and cooperating with God's work really working at it, detaching yourself from sin, from that self-love, growing in the virtues, practicing that prayer. Generally, it's a, a process. St. Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Avila was literally years, years um, moving towards this by God's grace. So don't be impatient. Uh, don't be worried if you're you know, you're just, you're just starting. Um, be generous with God. And uh, you've got some kind of a, some sense now of some practical things that you can do, some me methods of prayer, some ways of praying um, that you can engage in to sort of cooperate with God, that, you know, your soul, by God's grace, with God's work, can be made beautiful and you can grow in union with God. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, I have some recommendations, uh, some book recommendations. If you're kind of interested in this, maybe digging in a little bit deeper. Again, this is just like an introduction. Um, so if you're interested in maybe sinking your teeth a little bit more into this, I've got a few good uh, things that I can recommend you. And then what we'll do is we'll take if anybody has any questions. So here's my recommendations. First, a book called, um, well, actually, I'm going to start maybe with the Catechism. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is excellent. Its section on prayer is particularly good. And in the Catechism, which the fourth section is all about prayer, the last part of the Catechism is all about prayer. And uh, it's, it's excellent. It's the church's official teaching on prayer. So that's number one. Number two is this book. I'll hold it up closely. 
It's called The Fulfillment of All Desire. And it's by an author called Ralph Martin. Ralph Martin, The Fulfillment of All Desire. This is like a synthesis of uh, a lot of the wisdom of the saints throughout the ages. So like St. Bernard of Clairvaux, um, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Therese of Lisieux. Um, it just, it's, it's excellent. And then many, many, many more as well, but just, those are some of the giants. Okay. Right. This is a small one. This is a book. You might have to do some searching maybe to find it on Amazon or somewhere, but it's called the three ways of the spiritual life, right? I'm not going to hold it up. It's just a blank uh, cover, but the three ways of the spiritual life by father Garigou. Lagrange. Again, I'm going to put all these in the text. Okay. This is a nice, very short little volume that gives you a more, way more detailed um, description of those three ways, the purgative way, the illuminative way, and the unitive way. There's another book. This one is written by an Irish priest. Uh, his name is Father Eugene Boylan. He was a Cistercian in Ireland. Um, and died, I want to say, in the 1950s. Um, but he wrote this book called Difficulties in Mental Prayer. And I, I found it so helpful. I just thought it was so great. There's a lot of different things in there. And it's actually a book that you could do meditation with as well. It doesn't have points of meditation, but you could like read slowly through this. It's one of those books that you're not going to be able to plow through very quickly. But if you work your way slowly through it, I know you'll learn a lot and you'll definitely benefit from it. And then maybe the last uh, thing that I'd recommend is any of the writings of the greats, right? So any of the great saints, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Therese of Lisieux. And I actually read just last summer, uh, Mother Teresa's, the, the spiritual biography of Mother Teresa, which is called Come Be My Light. And uh, it, in it, it's the, it's the book that people were sort of like really shocked by that she like had this extraordinary darkness and struggle with her faith for like decades. Well, that's the dark night of the soul. <laughs> it's, I was, as I was like reading more and more about this, I was like, oh yeah, that's exactly what she was going through, you know? And she didn't realize it until a priest pointed it out to her as well, actually. So anyway, Come Be My Light. So I'll post those in the chat and um, yes. So I think what I'll do is I'll, if anybody has any questions um, and maybe we'll see if I can answer them. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm very much learning myself. So, okay. So I'm just going to read the question. Father, can you unpack a little the balance between trying to be less self-concerned and being curious about your interior life? Yeah. Um, I think that's great. I, uh, I think that your, our motivations are always going to be mixed always. Right. And we shouldn't let the fact that we have mixed motives stop us from doing something that's good. <laughs> so do that, you know, kind of dig into your interior life and all right, you're going to be doing it for mixed motives, you know, like everything that you do. Um, don't let that discourage you. Uh, press on and ask God to help purify your heart. Do you know, I was reading um, today, actually, I'm going through like doing meditation. Like I'm, I'm going through uh, the, the scripture passages. It's first Samuel 17 about David, right? King David. And David, when he was going to fight Goliath had super mixed motives. He, first of all, he was jealous for the the honor of God. He was appalled that Goliath, this pagan, right, would be insulting the living God. Good desire. But if you read carefully, he's also, he heard that these other soldiers were talking about how Saul, the king, was going to reward anyone who would kill Goliath and that he would have his daughter in marriage and his father would have this been given, be given like freedom. And, uh, David's like, ooh, he liked the sound of that as well, <laughs> right? So mixed motives, but David didn't let that stop him from doing what was good, namely like doing battle with Goliath. So 
that's that's just uh, one bit of reflection, I would say. Do what's good, do what's right, and then ask God to help purify your motive. What about people who don't have a spiritual director? Oh, yeah. I, I really, it's, it's very hard to find a spiritual director now. It's very, very difficult. No doubt about it. Um, the, the two things, that if you can't find a spiritual director are, first of all, uh, go to the saints, right? Go to the saints. They've experienced a lot, you know, like a lot of times what we're experiencing in prayer isn't rocket science. It's dryness, it's distractions, it's, you know, I don't know where to start. Where do I start? Like pick up some of the saints, some of the writings of the saints and they will help you, especially some of those like giants that I, I mentioned there. I, actually, I'll, I'm gonna give you one other book recommendation. Uh, it's actually a great place to start. Introduction to the Devout Life by St. Francis de Sales. Great book, great start, it's super practical and it's actually got some like meditation, some prayers in there that you can start with. It's excellent. So. Um, that's a good, go to the saints. Number one, number two is if you can find a confessor, that's like, you can go to consistently and maybe throw some questions at him. That would be good. That's my, those are my two recommendations, but it's very hard to find a spiritual director now. Oh, consoling the heart of Jesus is a good book. Absolutely. It is. It's an excellent book. Yeah. Father Michael Gately's book is great. Consoling the heart of Jesus. Good recommendation. So we'll just finish with a prayer and uh, I'll give you guys a blessing and uh, all of your families and all who are here to you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. And may Almighty God bless you all in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks very much, everybody.